Hold on to your butt. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. Oh, you want to fight? You want to fight? I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. You don't know anybody named Iris? I don't know nobody named Iris. Can I have a piece of toast? I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Western demands. How could you do this to me? Blit, I want to know. Why did you do that? What you feel only matters to you. Step back for one minute and look at the big picture. And that's all. No, no, not for the real fire. The orphans bond a family that very few can understand. Help me. Help you. <laughs> I don't do drugs. Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up? And welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I am your co-host, Iris. And I'm here with my older brother. Wesley! <laughs> Wait, that's not, that's not good. Wesley! Wesley! I can't do it. Today, we're talking a movie from 2017, set in 1989, dedicated to our most loyal Instagram follower, PennyFan37. It. It. Penny fan, you've been so active on our Instagram account. We really appreciate it. We made, I think, a pretty reasonable assumption that you like Pennywise the Clown. So we decided to do this one just for you. We've decided to review it for your benefit and also because it's an interesting movie to talk about. However, any opinions expressed should not be taken personally. Basically, what Wesley is saying is if we alienate you, we're sorry that was not our intention. <laughs> so it available on HBO Max. Both are available there, if I'm not mistaken. Chapter one and chapter two. So it chapter one featuring a terrifying Bill Skarsgård. One of the many Skarsgårds is is. Is he related to the other Skarsgårds? Indeed, he is the Andrew and the Stellan. Oh, what about the Peter? That's Sarsgård. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Come on, man. The Swedish are going to be up in arms. <laughs> um, what did he do before it? I don't know. Did he go to clown college? <laughs> no. I'm sure that he was around. He was just uh, the brother that hadn't broken through yet. Handsome guy, but really terrifying Pennywise the clown. I'm beginning to think, because when I saw the character design for Pennywise, I was like, that's kind of dumb, because it is kind of dumb. Clowns are supposed to look exaggerated and silly. And I guess if you're going to make a scary clown, you make him with a big giant head. But I don't know that that design looks scary. And I'm not even like a devotee of the Tim Curry Pennywise. Full disclosure, I've never seen Stephen King's It, the miniseries with Tim Curry, which his performance is hailed as being pretty good. And it's now on, available on HBO. I just couldn't with my work schedule squeeze in seeing that first. But the point I was going to make is he is a, you know, pretty good looking dude. Not one that you would think, oh, that dude obviously has the face of a murderous clown, right? <laughs> but Bill Skarsgård, I don't think anyone else could have done it. He can do the craziest things. He's like the Jim Carrey of scary clowns. <laughs> How do you get in the mix to be cast as Pennywise the Dancing Clown? I mean, when your agents come to you with, hey, um, Warner Brothers is casting for um, It, <laughs> aren't you immediately like, mm -mm, I don't, really? You think of me that way? Well, I guess if you're struggling to establish yourself in an already largely famous family, but he had to fully audition. Like on his own dime, he went and got some grease paint and made himself all clowny and rolled into this audition. So oh, Bill Skarsgård typified this experience as like a microcosmic example of what acting is. He dressed as a clown and had to drive across town in his clown makeup <laughs> and practicing maniacal laughs to himself as passengers, uh, like like pedestrians, stared at him. Ah, uh, This is, I think, an experience unique to Los Angeles, being on the 405, I guess, which is unique in and of itself, and then inevitably being next to somebody who is practicing their sides in the car next to you. And you like look over and they're like half driving, half looking down and half talking to themselves, like emphatically. You've seen this, right? I've never seen anyone in costume, let alone full clown makeup. <laughs> I would have immediately exited the freeway. That's freaky. <laughs> uh, Finn Wolfhard, as Richie Tozer, I think embodies the general public sphere of clowns in general, right? Because that's his thing. 
I'm, yeah, it is. And Pennywise is just another form that it chooses to take. But I've never really understood the innate terror of clowns. Somebody is responsible for this fear of clowns because it's not like people were terrified in the relatively recent past of Ronald McDonald. Or were they? I mean, I guess you have John Wayne Gacy in the mix, who was literally a killer clown. Was he really? Yeah, that was his deal. Did he go to clown college? I think so. What is your fascination with, like, Steve-O went to clown college. I don't know that that necessarily is a bad thing. Well, it doesn't exactly speak well of Steve-O. I mean, Steve-O is kind of lacking in the credibility. But isn't Steve-O all cleaned up now? Yeah, he's doing really well. I think that clowns, they just kind of tread the line a little bit because they're exaggerated and they're very happy. But there's also the sad clown trope where they got the little tear on the cheek thing. <laughs> Is it just the exaggerated nature of the clown that they can kind of tip either way? Yeah, like the actor crest or whatever, right? The happy and sad clown. It's just the theatricality of this comedy, I guess, going back to court jesters and junk. So you wouldn't have been scared in the clown marionette room that Richie has to enter? Scared, no. But if you were Richie, absolutely. When you know that clowns are the thing that he's afraid of is something. Also, when they ask Richie what he's scared of and he looks over his shoulder at the clown on that little bandstand or whatever during the dairy fair, not the cutest, happiest clown ever. <laughs> but that clown is terrifying. <laughs> uh, also, you know that Tim Curry's clown is in that room. A figure of it? Yeah, it's more of a bozo type where he's got the big red nose and like bald on top but has the red tufts on either side of his head. Well, Pennywise kind of has the bald on top thing. He's just got an extremely large forehead. Yeah, he has like a soft serve head. <laughs> He's very gleaming white. That room was definitely scary, especially when Pennywise pops out of the coffin or does he pop down onto the coffin? Both. It's super immediate because Richie looks inside, sees himself, his little marionette, all covered in maggots and junk. Yeah. And closes the lid in horror. And we had just looked inside. And within a fraction of a second, the lid pops open. Pennywise jumps clear of it and lands on the closed <laughs> lid. Okay. Top three scares in It Chapter One. Honestly, for me to this day, and I, look, I know what this movie is. This movie is a presentation of set pieces where he scares you in strange ways. Like, what? He's coming out of the projector? And I know that this movie is weird in that way. So it's kind of jump scary, but absolutely hands down. As a full-grown adult, when Georgie starts yelling, you'll float too. You'll float too. And he's, and he's starting to melt. That gives me chills every time. <laughs> He's laughing and giggling, and then he just descends into this monstrous, water-bloated, dead Georgie. Oh, man, it's terrifying. And then to add to that, Pennywise comes surfing out of the out of the wave. <laughs> right. And that was in some of the ads. So I knew that that was coming from that setting. But Georgie breaking down like that really freaked me out. Speaking of breaking down, why does his brain, like, disintegrate before he says fear? And then falls into the the abyss. Because of the lack of fear, Pennywise feeds on their fear. And when they're no longer afraid, when he confidently points the bolt gun at his head, even though it, when Mike does, even though it's empty, it has the effect because they're demonstrating their total lack of fear. And he just crumbles. And then he falls into the abyss. Scares that legitimately scared me? I don't know, because some of them were also dumb. But I know the parts that I revisit... I really like him getting out of the fridge where he untwists. Ooh. And there's a throwback to the novel, which had many more forms that it takes that we didn't see in the movie. It's very brief. But after Bev stabs him through the head with the thing when they're in, their, they're in the Niebold house, he's not having that. Eddie's on the floor and his arm is broken and they're trying to drag him out of the house. And Pennywise is coming after them with the monstrous grin and the, and the poker through his head. And he like extends his hand and his hand bursts through the glove and it looks like a werewolf hand. It's because it transforms into a werewolf in the novel that they didn't show. But Ooh. that's cool and terrifying. Him surfing out of the um, basement. That was uh, number three for me. Number two was definitely the projector. I think I just didn't see how it was going to come, how he was coming. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's his appearances and his scares defy logic. <laughs> and so I, I definitely was like, oh, shit. And I'm like watching it alone and like constantly getting chills. But the scariest scare was the simplest for me. And that was. Was it uh, Pennywise in the bushes? No. 
Oh, that was pretty creepy, though. That was with um, Stanley. No, Mike is being chased, and he looks up, and he's getting he's beating up on an arm, <laughs> on a child's arm, and then he waves the arm at him. <laughs> Definitely not a kid's movie, even though it's about kids. And again, these aren't like scary, like jump scares, but they're so horrifying that I can't stop thinking about them. Yeah. So what? And what's number one? Oh, number one for me was, like I said, the simplest, but probably the most unexpected. And it's just when Bev turns around and he's right there. Oh, yeah, that's a gnarly scare. It's really simple. He's just standing there. It's not like we get the Fright Night mouth. It's not like we get a jump. It's not like we get, you know, the arm chewy wave. He's just stand- <laughs> he's standing there. But I was like, I definitely jumped and was like, ah! He does gr- he does grab her by the throat. In the bathroom? But it's like it's as iconic as the jump scare in Alien. And the alien does the like the flashlight reveal and he like, gives you a hug to the camera. <laughs> That's right. Jazz and hands? It, it's not scary. Jazz hands. It's just like, ah! And, and you're scared until you rewind it. <laughs> uh, but I think she she had just defeated something or another in the bathroom. And you're like, ah, safe. And you're like, my guard was all down. And then he was just standing right there. Was it when she bonked her dad? Yes. She bonks him with the um, toilet lid. But let's talk about parents for a second here because they're not exactly portrayed in the most positive light either. Honestly, the whole way through, you can't tell who's it. But they're, t- no, they're, yeah, they're Stephen King parents for sure. They're terrible. Every single one of them. You know, Bev Marsh's dad is a form that Pennywise takes towards the end of the movie. And Eddie's mother is no picnic. But I think the only maybe kind of upstanding adult is Henry Bowers' dad. Right? The police chief guy. But he's a dick and he shoots at his kid's feet. Yeah, okay. Uh, granted, he's pretty bad. But he also is not, you know, as in the position of power, he's not the Stephen King sheriff that goes mad and starts killing people. Hmm. That happens. For whatever reason, they're all despicable. And they serve to alienate the kids further. Like, the kids can't count on their parents because they suck. And they don't understand. And sometimes they don't see. Illustrated by Bev in the bathroom. Yep. Was that supposed to be period blood? It was symbolic of period as a metaphor. It was just a larger picture what Bev is afraid of, obviously, as evidenced by her episode in the pharmacy. And then, yeah, her dad not seeing who she is at all. Was her dad an abusive molester? You think? He's in a Stephen King movie. (laughs) Because that was really gross. So did it, was its purpose to get kids to kill their parents? I think that that's a pretty decent byproduct for what he does. But no, not necessarily. I think the Pennywise form of it demonstrates this creature's predilection for predatory fun and hijinks. He revels in the torturous aspect of manipulating people through their fear. The, in these kids in particular. I'm not sure that this creature, because we delve much more into that in the book and in It Chapter 2, is specifically targeting kids, but I think that kids are the easiest, the most emotionally available, and can demonstrate the tastiest, loveliest fear. <laughs> Look, man, like we haven't gotten into the book. I tried to, have you ever tried to read Stephen King's It? Yeah. You know, it's like the the wait list is so incredibly long at the Los Angeles Public Library that I waited like a year to get my copy, my e audiobook. They should have special dispensations because if you were to get your hands on that book, I don't think you could get through it, even audio, even on 1.5 speed. I don't think you can get through it in the normal lending time. It's true. You get 21 or 24 days, and um, it's impossible. See, this is the problem. I waited a long time on a wait list to get the audiobook from the Los Angeles Public Library. I got it. I had 21 to 24 days. I listened to it three hours a day when I was commuting, and I got through the kids' section, and that was it. It's incredibly thick because you can't – it's like reading the dictionary and, like, doesn't lend – you don't get paperback dictionaries, right? I think this is Stephen King's crackheadiest book. What does that mean? He had a lot of substance abuse issues. Oh. And this is the one where he goes all the way off the rails into space. I I don't think, I've also had multiple attempts. Don't think I've ever gotten all the way through it. Really? And in fact, they weren't sure. I think that Andy Muschietti, the director, knew going in, you know, that if it was successful, the other part would follow. But he didn't really start planning it until this movie was really successful. But it's very necessary that it would be broken up into multiple parts. And I think it was extremely wise of him to focus on this 80s stand-by-me 
Goonies band of kids running around. And you could say that it was, oh, kind of like Stranger Things, especially with the Finn Wolfhard connection. Did you know the Duffer brothers were actually in consideration for directing it and they weren't considered established enough? Hmm. And so they grumbled and and took their little script that they and redeveloped it and it became Stranger Things, which was ultimately released before it, the movie. I did not know that. Stranger Things is basically their reworked version of the Losers Club from it. Yeah, but you don't think they're borrowing directly from it, do you? No, but they're borrowing directly from Stephen King, obviously. What's it? Stephen King meets um meets Steven Spielberg. That was the whole thing about Stranger was Things. Because Stranger Things came out in 2016. Halloween 2016. Yep. And one day we will see Stranger Things season four. And there's also been talk of a third It movie. I mean, it doesn't come close to covering everything in the book, but the overall arc for the book is completed, I guess, in two. There's speculation that a third will focus on the origins of Pennywise, will go back hundreds of years to the modern incarnation of the Pennywise character. Uh, We'll see how that goes. But uh, it didn't look like Bill Skarsgård was on board for Chapter 2 at all. He said that this role took a really heavy toll on him. He had nightmares pretty much continuously because he got really into the character. So he didn't really announce until kind of the last minute that, all right, he might be on board for another one. A third one is still up in the air, but I could see how they could do it. I mean, both were successful, even though, in my humble opinion, Chapter 2 dropped in quality. Do you think they can make it work? Should they make it work? Um, I would be happy to see another Pennywise movie, just because I think that 2 was less execution than I was looking for. But, but it had such a great cast. Oh, and a great adult cast, for sure. I could not have been more excited. That's why you were disappointed. I mean, there was a lot of buildup for sure. But I'll tell you, I don't know that this movie was, I think it was capably directed for a horror movie that relies on the jump scares that we talked about. Like, we're in a safe space. We're in the bathroom in Bev's house and her dad's in the house with a closed door and all that stuff. And then he's right there. Or they're in the garage all together with a projector. What could go wrong? Okay, he's in the projector somehow. And then he pops out of the projector (laughs) at like 4X size. And with giant teeth. And you're like, whoa, because it's disarming, right? But a lot of it was gimmicky because what he spent a lot of time doing was popping out, scaring the kids, and then being beaten back so that he, like, retracts. Like the painting lady backs up and and disappears into the sewer. That was great. He spends a lot of time jumping out to scare them and then, like, retreating. Well, he can't eat up our heroes. Yeah, no, but he does eat the shit out of some Stanley for a second. You're like, holy cow. (laughs) He was eating his face with his giant mouth thing. (laughs) When he CPRs him. So I'm going to dispute this claim that it's well directed. I think the director pulled it off. But there are a lot of scenes that are like, why did that happen? I don't know. After the leper, which was terrible, by the way, in a not good way. It's a little unclear that it's a leper. Exactly. And I think that's the problem that Andy Muschietti faces. He writes these scenarios like, wouldn't it be cool? And they didn't keep the werewolf that I really wanted to see, but they kept the leper. But Andy Muschietti's idea sometimes of scary is either terrifying, eating a child's arm all bloody with red eyes. But then it's also the googly eyed, like scary but funny face. Does Pennywise don that face? Yeah, like, is the leper scary when he's like, and his eyes like all spinning in its socket? It's kind of dumb. And then Eddie. That's just because you're looking at it critically and objectively. If you're in it. In it, maybe. But then Eddie sees Pennywise and he has the balloons and the weird triangular formation. And he says, if you lived here, you'd already be home. And then he gets distracted and the balloons pop and and Pennywise is gone. It's like, that was weird. Why did that happen? And the whole movie is kind of like that. It's set up for the creep factor, but it doesn't really make a tremendous amount of logical sense. The through line is that Bill is looking for Georgie and they're all kids going through the normal terrifying fear stuff of being an uncertainty of being a kid with adults you can't trust and Pennywise just happens to come back during that era. And other than that, it's kind of loose. What a wonderful arc Bill has though. He's looking for Georgie, he finds Georgie, and he ultimately lets him go. That's nice, nice way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way of putting shooting your little brother in the head. Um, but he's able to let go. He's able to acknowledge that whatever hope he was holding on to was fear. And I thought it was kind of brilliant and kind of 
pulled off by Jaden Martell. I mean, these kids are, they're all a little hit or miss. They're kids. But Jaden is carrying a lot of this movie, and I think successfully. But other than that, obviously Finn Wolfhard is a standout, not only from Stranger Things, but because he and Ghostbusters, which Afterlife, which we should have had by now, but don't. uh, And because he has the mouth, Corey Feldman, Stand By Me, Goonies, kind of, he's the guy who swears a bunch, makes a bunch of crass jokes, and is the character. He's definitely the wisecracking Ultimately, very loyal and sensitive sidekick. Sophia Lillis, I think, had Nancy Drew for a little bit. But those were definitely the standouts among the kids. I'm afraid you're never going to see Chosen Jacobs again, the one that played Mike. Jeremy Ray Taylor is Ben. Why was Henry Bowers, Nicholas Hamilton, as Henry Bowers so mean? Like, did he just hate the world and hate everybody that he wanted to just kill everybody? Yeah, he was like ace, man. He's just a bad dude. They're very much types, not only as for like these small towns or whatever, but also for 80s movies. And they all, everybody, all these kids had their roles. Ben was the quiet, nerdy one, and Bev Aww. was the tomboy, and etc. Let's talk about the love triangle. <laughs> Who cares about the love triangle? Come on. It's like, I think, I think Stephen King wrote that poem and was extremely proud of it <laughs> and wanted to play it up as much as humanly possible. He's like, look at this poem I wrote. <laughs> Which makes no sense. It's kind of childlike. But the movie ends with a kiss. You can't deny the love triangle. Yeah, but it also ends with a blood bond. Yeah, we've talked about this before. You, I mean, you really don't have to cut that deep. <laughs> Not at all. You could, you could take a th- like a thumbtack and you can get enough blood out of a thumb wound. It always has to be their palm, like Robin Hood style. <laughs> My father's death will be avenged and like rakes a dagger across his palm. It's not a sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're doing it with like dirty, jagged glass, like just poke it in. Yeah, but those kids are tough. They'll survive COVID because they were dirty and they cut themselves with like sewer glass, <laughs> gray water and junk. Yeah, Bev, the toughest. All she does is like flinch a second. All the rest of them are grimacing. She's like, mm. yeah. When it's time to go back into the Niebold house and they decide one of them needs to stay behind to keep an eye out. And who wants to stay behind? Everyone raises their hand except Bev. We get it. You're tough. Well, you know, she's got something to prove being the only chick and stuff. What I was going to say is I don't know that this movie is terribly well directed. It's well set up and the scares come through in a really effective way. But but you're saying that on the basis that it was illogical when you were just saying that's Pennywise's whole thing, that he defies logic. Do you think that a a wise stylistic choice was really playing up the new kids on the block setup? And was that worth the payoff? Did you believe these characters as anything beyond 80s kids tropes? Um, It didn't seem they had the Molly Ringwald reference. They had the new kids reference. They had um, there were a few other cultural references that they are, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street 5. Like these things are supposed to firmly ground us in the late 80s. But the new kids thing was Bev and Ben's little secret that we were let in on. And it was kind of cute. I got to say, I'm surprised by this. That I'm all defending it. Yeah, you had seen this movie, obviously, and I don't remember you having the best opinion I of didn't. it. I didn't. And it remains to see what your ultimate review will be. But I felt like it was fairly routine. And I wondered, going back to, because if you look at the Goonies, you can see some obvious silly things, fantastical elements of which it has no shortage. But Stand By Me was real, right? It's like a bygone era, but kids are still kids and kids are the same. And I wonder if there are groups of kids who are the Losers Club growing up. And they're like, it was all about my childhood. And I remember that movie so fondly because of it. Are there like teenagers now? And it was like their defining moment in cinema. I wonder. Well, it is both Stephen King stories. It is a lot scarier and a lot less accessible than Stand By Me. But Stand By Me's simplicity is just so brilliant. Like, you know, this morbid curiosity about the Ray Brower kid and their journey to find it and what they discover about themselves along the way. I mean, this, I guess, is very rooted in Bill's arc, but it has a lot of just kind of random, gratuitous, scary violence otherwise. The first time I saw it, I have to say I was disappointed and I blame you for that because you were all about it. I came to it late in the game. You had hyped it up big time and I was like all excited to watch it and then I watched it and I was like, hmm. And maybe I was scared and I was like blaming it for that. But I was kind of oddly really excited to rewatch this film. 
And I think I was able to appreciate it more, uh, maybe because I was approaching it objectively and critically. I hear what you're saying. And yes, I was excited about this movie and I bought it. And it seems like I'm kind of trashing it now. But the story is, is, is interesting. At least it is to me. We went to Palm Springs on vacation and we went to like a spa hotel where Kelly went to go get her massage. And as you know, I have no interest whatsoever in that. So I was like, I'm going to go see a movie. I guess I'm going to go see it. And so I went by myself. I walked out of the hotel across the street in like 100 degree heat, sat down in the theater. It was nice and cool. I got a bunch of snacks and I had a good time and I left the theater and I was like, oh, that's kind of, un you know, it was fine, I guess. This is some creepy moments. It was cool. And I got back and told Kelly as much, who was all relaxed from her massage. And then we were going to go grab food or something. And I realized I didn't have my wallet. And I was wearing these weird shorts and I never wear shorts and the pockets were really shallow and my wallet fell out of my pocket during the movie, Ugh. I guess at some point. And I was all kind of amped up from this, from a scary movie. And all of a sudden everything was a drama. So I was like, oh my God. And so I raced back to the theater all worried because I had like 200 bucks in my wallet, 300 bucks, something like Oof. that. That's a total bummer. Thankfully it was like a, you know, a sleepy Saturday afternoon or something. And, uh, I walked up and I said, my wallet. And they're like, oh yeah, Bob has it or whatever. And I went in the back and this nice kid handed me the wallet. And I was like, thank you so much. And honestly, I opened my wallet with the intention of giving this kid money, not like to check to see if the money was still there. And there was a lot of money in my wallet. And so I, instead of the hundred that I anticipated giving this kid, I gave him two twenties for like 40 bucks or whatever. And I still feel bad about that. So then I went back to the hotel and I said, I don't know what's happening. Like it was so strange coming out of this movie. And then I lost my wallet and I was worried about losing like 300 bucks and I got my wallet and there was like seven or $800 in it. And I was like, what is happening right now? Like, it doesn't make sense. And Kelly was like, yeah, I wasn't going to tell you if you like lost it for good, but I gave you some cash to like pay for the ho help with the hotel room. She likes because I paid for it and she sneaked money into my wallet, which I then promptly <laughs> lost. So I was like strangely unsettled. And then this stupid clown popped into my head for days and weeks afterwards. I started to obsess in some weird way about some of the scenes. I like bought it immediately, got the digital copy and talked it all up for you. And I don't know that it holds up as a great movie, but it got in my head somehow. This clown stuck in my craw and there were so many memorable, scary moments. I think that the most contested part of our review is the direction because it, for me, it builds very consistently. It could have been tediously episodic, but it isn't. They, the first couple get kids get their it encounters. They pepper in some, you know, friendship building scenes. We move pretty effortlessly through time over the winter, spring, and summer of 88 and 89. We get a nice little climax teaser when they go to Nebolt, and then the sewer takes it to the other level. Like, it has a nice build. It has a nice cadence. It deals with the illogic of it in a way that isn't too confusing. He's handling an unwieldy cast of kids with of all different experience and acting levels. It's pretty deft, I think. I like it. I really do. Maybe some of my disappointment stems from It Chapter 2 and Mama, which was, I think, the closest that we've gotten from this director before he did It. I felt like the other movies, Mama and In Chapter 2 specifically, kind of showed me the gimmick that Andy Muschietti has that he applied to it that for some reason just worked better. This movie, Standing Alone, is a weird horror gem. It was one of the Halloween movies that I sat Kelly down to watch, and she thought, I thought it was going to be, I was like, don't worry. It's like, she's not too big into horror movies. I said, this is Stranger Things with Cursing basically. And she said that I was dead wrong. She's like, it is scary. And there are moments in it that are shocking. Like the child's arm thing. I can't believe every time I see that, I'm like, I can't believe they got away with that on film. So there's a lot of good things, but no, I do. I like it. A lot of strange things. Give me your best Pennywise impression. I've found my, that I don't have the laugh, but I'd be like, hiya, Irisy. <laughs> you, you want an otter pup? <laughs> kind of sound like mom 
I think the, what I've come to land on is that it's all about Pennywise, who has a really small amount of screen time, even smaller in Chapter 2. But I think it's all about Bill Skarsgård, his ability to do that mouth thing that he does, that eye thing. You're aware of this eye thing, right? I don't, I'm afraid to tell you that I don't think he was actually rolling his eyeballs out of the sockets or ex- extendo mouthing it for realsies. Dude, that face he does, only he can do it. And that's, I think, what got him the part. What are you talking about? It's his ability to screw up his mouth and do the Pennywise smile, which is iconic now. But let me tell you, Andy Machete on the set, he's like, I think it's going to be really cool if his eyes, like, kind of drift in this disconcerting way, uh, inferring that they could add it in post. And Bill Skarsgård's like, you mean like this? (gasps) And then did it with his eyeball? No! It's the craziest thing. Nobody could do it except this dude. And he totally carries Uh, this movie because he is uh, Pennywise and Pennywise is it. It's all about him for me. And I give it a solid all right. Come on. Don't skimp on it. You think it deserves a totally? From you? Yeah. The YouTube video clips of Pennywise get a totally from me. Suddenly I give it a good. And that's the beauty of or whatever movies. 818-835-0473 818-835-0473 or whatever movies at gmail.com. Uh, let us know what you think about Stephen King's It. Um, a review that we did, especially for our one of our most devoted Instagram followers and friends, at PennyFan37 on Instagram. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.